atrophied. It doesn't get proper nourishment, so it never it can grow to its proper strength, maturity, scope, and so on. Because they're fed so many lies. Uh, it's like poison for the intelligence. So if someone is given poison, of course they're not going to be healthy. But this is the, this is the uh, state of our intelligence in uh, material world, in the material society. So then if this kind of untruth also invades the ashram, then where are we? How are we going to get out of this mess? Too much joking, too much nonsense talk, prajalpa. Actually, prajalpa means crazy talk. Hmm? The talk of an insane person is known as prajalpa. That's the, that's the actual meaning of, of the word. When Srimati Radharani is in her state of mahabhava and she's speaking all kinds of crazy things, this is called prajalpa. That's the, the transcendental meaning. But the ordinary meaning is just crazy talk. So we should avoid this crazy talk. Huh? I mean, it's OK to joke around a little bit and like that. But when the whole conversation becomes like that, it's like it's useless, it's valueless. What's the value of it? Simply get people to laugh a little bit? I mean, come on. You know, it's a kind of sense gratification. And like most sense gratification, it leads to degradation. Degradation of intelligence, degradation of consciousness. We don't want that. So we should avoid that in the ashram. We should avoid that in our community. We should make a conscious effort to focus our conversations and our communications on Krishna, the absolute truth, devotional service, the scriptures, like that then we're making proper use of our speaking power. There is something in India which is called Vak Siddhi. Vak Siddhi. V-A-K Siddhi. And Vak Siddhi means the power of speech. It means that whatever you say is what happens. Uh, so many times I have uh, challenged people that look at these things that we wrote years and years ago about the current situation. It all has come true. You see? And now, similarly, the things that we're saying now, they will also come true. But still, people remain skeptical. Huh? I guess they've just been cheated too much. But the thing is, we have made a conscious effort over many, many years' time to speak only the truth. I mean, yeah, sometimes we joke around a little bit, but 99% of the time, what we're saying is based on absolute truth or related to absolute truth in some way. Uh, this is very conscious and deliberate. I idolize Yudhishthira. King Yudhishthira was so truthful that even his enemies would rely on his truthfulness. He didn't care who he was speaking to. He, would, he refused to be diplomatic and uh, mince his words and like that. He was always truthful. And this was a great, great uh, vow that he had taken, to be always truthful. So his character is so wonderful. It takes a person like this to really lead and inspire people. Uh, because they know they're getting the straight, straight uh, stuff from him. He's not... He's not being diplomatic and he's not, you know, mincing words, beating around the bush. Straight up, truthful. That quality is very desirable. Huh? So it's not that we never laugh or that we never joke. Huh? You know very, very well. Sometimes we uh, make uh, jokes and have a good sense of humor, actually. But the point is we don't waste our time with frivolous talks. Talks that have no relation to the absolute truth. Huh? Even if we make a joke, it should have some bearing on spiritual philosophy or the truth. That's very important. Otherwise, we're wasting our breath, we're wasting our time, we're wasting other people's time. And I won't tolerate it. 
So we have to tighten up our standard before we go to India. It's very important. Speaking of which, does anybody have any questions? Any questions so far? Yeah. Any time during the talk. Hare Krishna. Okay. So, question from Theo. Theo. I know some people who are using bija mantras for their chakras or in laya yoga with the great cosmic powers such as Tara, Tripura, Sundari, etc. Are these Bija mantras completely ineffective or do they give some kind of results? They give some kind of results, but they're very material. Anything, I mean, try to understand, anything that's related to chakras is related to the material body. And any result obtained in relation to the material body is temporary. When the material body goes, then the results also go. So what's the use of this? See, these people don't know the first thing about spiritual life. The first thing about spiritual life is given in Bhagavad Gita 2.16. Uh, the seers have determined that whatever is temporary does not really exist. That which exists is eternal. This the seers have determined by studying the nature of both. So how can you study that which is eternal? Well, we've gone over this again and again. You have to start watching your own consciousness. Start studying the qualities of consciousness, the actions of consciousness, the means of working with and changing consciousness. Then you'll understand a lot more about Krishna because Krishna is similar to us. He's a conscious being also. Huh? So try to understand consciousness and you'll understand the eternal because consciousness is eternal. After all, if it isn't eternal, then we're all sunk because the moment that we're not conscious anymore, we practically speaking, we cease to exist. So if, if consciousness isn't eternal, then we don't really exist either. Huh? Might as well just go out and become a Buddhist or something. <laughs> but if consciousness does exist, then it's eternal. Huh? And that's what Krishna says, that the soul is eternal, immortal, indestructible, primeval. It can never be hurt, wounded, cut, dried, burned or harmed in any way. Huh? That's who we are, that's what we are. So if we're not conscious of the spiritual world, if we're not conscious of consciousness to begin with, then we're conscious of the senses or the mental world. And this is all material. So people think that by following their energy through the chakras, they're doing something spiritual. But this is just, I don't know, it's, it's very preliminary to spiritual life. Uh, it's just working with prana or energy or chi, or whatever you want to call it. There, I, there, I met Chinese kids in Guam, 12 years old, who could do better kundalini yoga than any of these rascals I ever ran into who were teaching kundalini yoga. Uh, because they had been taught Qigong from the age of five or six. And they were already very adept at manipulating the energy in their chakras. But so what? Even so, you know? Yeah, maybe you can, you know, turn the circulation in your hand on and off. Big deal. What use of that? What use is that in terms of ultimate uh, attainment of spiritual consciousness? It's very, very preliminary. It's a step 
toward the understanding that I'm not my body, I'm a spirit soul. But that understanding is given right the first thing in Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita begins from the point way beyond where these guys are at. Why do we even consider them? They're not authorities. They're not. Where, what Vedic scripture is their teaching derived from? Uh, they can't even show you, they can't even quote one shloka from the Vedas, actual Vedas. Maybe they have some bogus Vedic, you know, Sanskrit, derivative Sanskrit scriptures. But they're not Vedic. They're not part of the Vedas. They're not by Vyasadeva. Uh, so they may be following some derivative or secondary or tertiary even. Sanskrit scriptures, but they're not Vedic because they don't come to the Vedic conclusion. The Vedic conclusion is Bhajagovinda, 